So welcome back everybody. This video covers uh, really sections 11.1 .1 and 11.2, but really the way we're going to do it in class is we're going to lump together chapters 11 and 12, because they both talk about something called the hypothesis test. Um, and really sections 11.1 .1 and 11.2 are just different flavors of hypothesis tests. I want to begin with this chart, which is one we've kind of looked at before. In general, we've been talking about inference for a while. We did that in chapter 10. And inference is going to be the big topic throughout chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Um, recall that what do we mean by inference? We mean using a statistic to estimate an unknown parameter. That's exactly what we were doing back in chapter 10 when we talked about confidence intervals. Well, it turns out the way we're going to think about inference in AP stat is that there's kind of two big categories. There's confidence intervals, which we talked about in chapter 10, but now there's something called hypothesis tests, which we're going to talk about in chapters 11 and 12. Um, both of them fall into the big category of inference, and there's some different vocabulary and things, but we're still, for example, going to use the inference toolbox, slightly modified for hypothesis tests. So I'm going to begin with actually a complete example, and then we're going to go through and talk about the different, different vocabulary in this example. Okay, so here's just a very silly example. Um, bags of jelly beans are supposed to have 200 jelly beans. The population standard deviation, that means sigma, of a bag is five jelly beans. You suspect the bags are being underfilled, so you take a sample of 50 bags and you calculate the sample mean, that's an X bar, to be 198.2. Is this evidence that the bags are being underfilled? So how is this different than the problems in chapter 10? We'll notice it doesn't say do a confidence interval like all those other problems did. Um, you're going to see a phrase like, is this evidence that? Um, that's probably a huge hint to you that you should do a hypothesis test. There are some other kind of variations of this phrase. It won't always say exactly, is this evidence that? But that kind of idea lends itself that you should always do a hypothesis test. So I'm going to run through the inference toolbox. I'm going to gloss over some of the differences, and then we're going to come back and pick those up later on. So step one of the inference toolbox is uh, the parameter here against mu. Population mean number of jelly beans per bag, that's unknown, exactly as it was in confidence intervals. We're doing this whole part down here is new. H was a little sub O. H sub O stands for the null hypothesis, and H sub A stands for the alternative hypothesis. So what we think here is that mu actually is 200, right? That's what we think. They're supposed to contain that. And we're checking, are the bags underfilled? Does mu actually, is mu actually less than 200? And we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but I just wanted you to see it. Null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, what you, what's supposed to be true, what you think might be true, what you're testing. Okay, and now we step two is the conditions. The good news is these conditions are exactly the way they were with confidence intervals. So we'll assume the bags are in SRS. Since n is greater than 30, the CLT applies. Since there's 10 times 50 bags, we're we'll assuming the bags are independent, exactly as it was with um, confidence intervals. Absolutely no difference here. Okay, here's the sort of big difference. Uh, the formula is different. So here's our formula that we're going to talk about with um, hypothesis tests. We'll talk about it in more detail later on. But basically what you do is you calculate a z-score, right? Then remember a z-score was statist or x bar minus mu over standard deviation. Sort of same idea here. This is this formula that familiar to this is the standard deviation of x bar. So we calculate a z-score, which is negative 2.54, which is a basically fancy way of saying that for the sampling distribution, this x bar is negative 2.5 standard deviations away from what we think mu is. Right? This, that's exactly what we think about as a z-score. And then we draw this picture down here. This is, this is the uh, normal curve, the sampling distribution of x bar. And we get this shaded area right here, which is um, 198.2 or less, has a this P stands for probability of about half of a percent. So what do you think about what does this number mean? This is the this area here. This is the probability of getting a, a bag of 198.2 or less. I should say, sorry, a sample mean. It's the probability of getting an X bar of 192, 198.2 or less if mu actually in the middle is 200. So there's a half a percent chance of getting this particular X bar. And now we just kind of do this analysis that we've talked about before, uh, but now we're going to go into more detail. So there is about a half of a percent chance of getting an X bar of 198.2 or less 
due to just random variation if mu is actually 200. So I think we, we got this particular X bar. We took 50 bags, we got 198.2. Well, there's two ways that could possibly happen. It could have just been random chance. Happened at the 50 bags you took, happened to have fewer than normal jelly beans, but actually, in general, it, it, you know, mu actually is 200. You know, if mu actually was 200, could you get an X bar of 198.2 or less? You could, right? There's two possibilities. Either it happened by random chance, or mu is actually not 200, meaning the bags are actually underfilled. Well, what we just calculated, the probability of it happening by random chance is about half of 1%. Well, that's really, really unlikely. So I wrote, since this result is really unlikely, and this is a little bit new vocabulary, we'll reject the null hypothesis, and there's evidence that the bags are underfilled. Abilities, right? You got this particular X bar, either the bag, either that happened by random chance, or the bags were being underfilled. We calculate the probability of it happening by random chance, and oh look, that number is so low that we're saying there's evidence that our assumption that the mu was 200 is actually incorrect and the bags are being underfilled. And you'll get lots of practice with that as we go on. Okay, now I just want to pause a little bit and do some vocabulary. What do we mean by the null hypothesis? Well, the null hypothesis is usually what you assume to be true. So H sub O is the null hypothesis, and I wrote mu equals 200. When you write the null hypothesis, it's always what you're assuming to be true in the problem, what you're, what's supposed to be true. It's always an equal sign, that's what I wrote here, and it's always a parameter, mu. The null hypothesis is never in terms of a proportion. This will never be an X bar here. Now, I will say when we get into uh, proportions, this might end up being a P, but it'll always be a parameter, a mu or a P or something. It'll never be an X bar or a P hat. Your alternative hypothesis, which is H sub A, is what you're kind of testing. Here we're testing that mu is less than 200. Again, it's always it's the same parameter. If you wrote mu here, you write mu here. If you wrote p here, you write p here. You'll never write x bar in either of these. If you're in equals here, which you always will, there's three possibilities here. Not equal to, less than, or greater than. The context of the problem on the previous page told us this should have been a less than, but yet, it, how to determine whether it's one of these three kind of takes, um, because of the context of the problem. And we'll get, we'll get a lot of practice with that also. So always equals, and then either not equal to, less than, or greater than. Okay, And these are always the same symbol, and these are always the exact same number. Okay, So the only difference between what you write here and what you write here is the symbol in the middle. You'll just see this term, so let's talk about it really quickly. There's something called a one-sided test and something called a two-sided test. If the symbol you write for HA, your alternative hypothesis, is a less than or a greater than, that's called a one-sided test because you end up shading just to one side, either to just the less than side or just the greater than side. If the symbol you end up deciding is a not equal to, that ends up being called a two-sided test because, hey, look, you shade to both sides. So don't freak out about that term, but you'll see it sometimes in the book. Is it a one-sided test or a two-sided test? That's all it means. Um, our book's going to talk about something called the test statistic, and I want to just make it clear what that means. The test statistic is this Z right here. It's the number of Z scores. Now, it won't always be Z. It's going to hint it's going to change to T in front of some examples later on. But I want to give you, this is the general formula for all hypothesis tests. The test statistic is the statistic minus the parameter over the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Very much like the z-score formula. In fact, if you look here, the statistic is x bar, the parameter is mu, the standard deviation, the sampling distribution is sigma over the square root of n. Um, you know, this what's what statistic, what parameter, and what standard deviation of sampling distribution? Those things might change in future more complicated formulas, but in general, it always kind of works like this. Okay, there's going to be something called a p-value, and the p symbol for p-value is p, which is unbelievably confusing because we're going to start talking about proportions, and now you're going to have a p and a p that mean different things. But let's not worry about that for right now. In the pre, let's say I, let's say I did some problem and I got I shaded this area and I got a p-value of 0.02. Well, that's the probability of getting the statistic you got 
or at least that unusual, meaning like you got um, that statistic or less, or that statistic or more, if HO was true. Um, it's kind of the probability of this random event happening, if you will. It's so, something unusual happened. You took a sample. That sample was unusual because it was not what you expected it to, meaning probably your X bar was not exactly the same thing as a mu. Well, what's the probability of that happening? The probability of happening is what then we're calling that the p-value. And just recall that our cutoff for unusual is usually 5%, what we talked about in a couple months ago. Um, so basically what you're going to do in all these problems, the big picture is you calculate a p-value, which takes a little work. There's a complicated formula. There's a whole inference toolbox. But the answer, if you will, to every question is your p-value. And then you say, is that p-value less than 5%? And if it is, you call that event unusual. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Okay? But basically, this, is the, this, is, this p value is probably the most important number in all of hypothesis testing. Just want to talk a little bit about how the inference toolbox is a little bit different. Um, same four steps in the inference toolbox we had for confidence intervals. Okay? The first thing we do is we're going to calculate or um, we'll write down the unknown parameter. Now I'm also going to have you write down what is your HO and your HA. And then, I didn't do this on this page, but eventually we're also going to start naming the procedure because we're going to start pretty soon having lots of different types of confidence intervals and lots of different types of hypothesis tests. So eventually we're going to start naming them. The good news is step two of the inference toolbox, the conditions totally unchanged from before. Step three, calculations. Well, here's the formula we talked about in the previous example. But in general, our formula is always going to look something like this. And again, your goal here is to use that z-score or that test statistic to calculate a p-value. Finding the p-value is kind of the answer, if you will, to step three. And then step four is interpret. There's enough there that I want to talk about on the next page. So this is kind of a template that is a model for the paragraph you will always write for step four for, for the inference toolbox for confidence, for, excuse me, for hypothesis tests. There's a, you know, 2% chance of getting a sample this unusual, meaning of getting an X bar less than whatever due to random variation. Since this is either likely or unlikely, and that depends whether this p-value is greater than or less than 5%, we will either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And reject just basically means it was unlikely to happen, so therefore it's like the more large, most rational people would say that the null hypothesis, what you assumed, is not true. And therefore there is or is not evidence that whatever you were is your alternative hypothesis. If you read, and notice I, the way I made this template is if you pick unlikely here, you, then you must pick reject and is evidence. If you picked likely here, then you must pick fail to reject and then is not evidence. And I'll go through we'll several examples of this, and trust me, in about a week or so, you'll have this just totally committed to memory. And by the way, you don't need to write exactly this. Certainly, you know, different, there's a little creative license here. You can rework it a little bit, but kind of these three sentences, one, two, three, this is a template to follow. And many students, just if you follow this template, you'll never be wrong. Just one last little vocabulary before we do some examples. Our books sometimes talk about something called alpha. This is the Greek letter alpha. Looks like a little, it's a lowercase a in Greek. It's a little fish. This stands for the significance level. And this is a, just a fancy way of saying this is the threshold for what we mean to be unusual. All year, we've been using an alpha value of 5%. I told you that 5% is the cut, cutoff or threshold for what we mean to be an unusual event. We'll use alpha as 0.05 if they don't give us one. Every once in a while, there's some random question where it'll say something like, you know, do this problem, oh, and by the way, alpha is 10%, or maybe alpha is 1%. Um, if they do that, then they tell you that's your threshold for what it means to be unusual, and you should use that. Um, if you've got a p-value of 7%, normally we would not say that's unusual because it's above 5%, but if they told us to use an alpha of 10%, then yes, we would say it's unusual. This is just a threshold for what we mean of unusual. And that's all alpha means, so don't, don't kind of freak out about that. Um, just a little bit of kind of rookie mistake um, help. We always, we never accept the null hypothesis. The two choices here, 
or you can reject the null hypothesis, or you can fail to reject the null hypothesis. We will never write the phrase, I accept the null hypothesis. It's kind of like the difference between a court case can either find you guilty or not guilty. A court case can never find you innocent. So either there is evidence that the jelly bean bags are being underfilled, or there is not evidence they're being underfilled. Notice there I did not say there is evidence that the bags are correctly filled, right? Very, very subtle difference. Think about the difference between the following two phrases. There is, there is evidence that the bags are not underfilled, and there is, I'm mixing myself up now. There is evidence the bags are not underfilled, and there is not evidence that the bags are underfilled. So let me say that again. There is evidence the bags are not underfilled, and there is not evidence the bags are underfilled. Those two sentences mean very different things. In one case, you're kind of saying there is evidence that something is not true. Another way of saying there's not evidence. They, they mean slightly different things. And if you think about the difference between innocent and not guilty, that's kind of the best way to think about them.